Hello, Singapore. Woo, thank you. <laughs> so, let me, let me introduce myself. I'm um, Akira from Japan. I'm um, like this on the internet. Um, as I was introduced, I, I'm a Ruby committer. Lives in a Rubyist village in the Ruby Island. Um, also a Rails committer. Well, I guess Aaron, Aaron Patterson and me are the only two persons who have the direct commit access to both of these repositories, I mean, um, Ruby and Rails. Also, I'm a gem author, um, mainly Rails plugins, like um, the one at the top, Kaminari, uh, the page nation library for Rails. But my recent role is like an event organizer, mainly, rather than a code writer. I'm organizing the Ruby conference in Japan as the main person. So let me promote my event a little bit. It's called Ruby Kaigi. And it's gonna be held in September in Hiroshima. Tickets are on sale. You can find more information here on that, our beautiful website, looking like this. And so, just don't miss it, okay? So this is me. I'm really glad to be here and be able to do a keynote here today. Thank you very much for having me. So today, I'm going to show you things like these, the new features that the Ruby team recently introduced in the major version 2 to the language, and, um, and how Rails uses these new features of Ruby, right? And, and things I did for, like, around these new features, okay? So let's begin. Firstly, about both of these versions of Ruby and Rails. These are the rough timeline. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> So you see, <clears throat> um, Rails 4 came together with Ruby 2, and the important part is the, this, this square. Rails 5 supports only Ruby 2.2, 2, <clears throat> as I said, <coughs> sorry. So in other words, we, we bumped up the major version of Rails because we wanted to drop support for Ruby 2.0 and Ruby 2.1. So these are the supported version of Ruby, oh, sorry, Rails 4 and 5. This means that Rails 5 can use, um, Rails 5 can use Ruby like less than 2.2 two, two features, and, but Rails 5 cannot use Ruby 2.3 new features and 2.4 new features and 2.5 new features, right? This, it su still supports Ruby 2.2, right? So, what are the new features in recent versions? These are some of the new things that I'm gonna cover in my talk today. Okay. So, let's start off with module prepend. This is actually one of my favorite feature of Ruby 2. Now let's go back the history a little bit and see how we were doing, dealing with monkey patches before Ruby, I mean, um, prepend being introduced into Ruby, okay. Before module prepend, we were using something called alias method chain to extend existing methods. It's a part of active support and the implementation was just this, two alias methods. It was initially implemented back in 2006. So it was, as I showed you, it was very 
beautifully simply implementation, simple implementation. Not just it's super useful, it's, it's very simple indeed. And this is how we use the feature. For example, um, where there's a method called foo, you can extend foo's behavior with um, defining foo with bar and calling foo without bar from inside the foo with bar, okay? But this feature actually had a little bit of downside, uh, I mean like pitfall, because this feature was not a language core feature, it was just a workaround basically. And it, so it creates some like intermediate methods. In the previous example, foo with bar and foo without bar, these methods are actually publicly called from outside and you can't tell what's gonna happen when these methods are called. What I'm talking about is like um, these methods, foo with bar and foo without bar, it's actually in the list of public methods, right? So what's wrong with these methods? Here's a example that I showed you, extending foo with bar, okay? It looks like it's working, but um, so the difference is that um, you extend food with bar and with baz for the first example, and the next example is extending the same method with baz first and then bar next, and you see that the result changes, right? When you called foo without bar met method, right? So, like this, you cannot really tell what's gonna happen with that calling, uh, when you call that public method, foo without bar. But it's still callable. So, in the real world example, for example, think of this case. Um, you have two Rails plugins that extend one same method listed in this gem file, and when you change the order of these like uh, gems in the gem file, your code may, may break in some case. So we needed a more robust monkey patching tool. And so Yehuda cuts proposed module prepend as the Ruby language core feature in Ruby 2.0. So this is the feature, module prepend. It uses a module instead of aliases. Of course they know, I guess. It's a very clean way of monkey patching because it's not gonna create any like ugly methods like with something or without something. Okay. But still, there's a pitfall. When you mix it, alias method chain and prepend. So this is an example of mixing. So if you, um, there's a existing class C and Firstly, you extend the method with ls method chain and then extend it with prepend. It just works, right? But if you put prepend first, then ls method chain, it's gonna die. Um, it's gonna cause infinite loop. So this means alias method chain and prepend can never coexist. You're gonna be killed, okay? So, so um, alias method chain is um, so, so dangerous, so you, um, you're discouraged to use it. You, please do never use it anymore. And, 
especially if you're a plugin author or library author, please stop using Ellis method chain right now. Okay. And actually, you can use both in one code base if you really would like to by like um, switching by Ruby version. But since the it's a slightly different, so it's, it's actually hard to support both. <clears throat> so, because of this, um, many gems stopped supporting Ruby 1 because it's hard to support both 1 and 2. This is the reason I like this feature, because it killed Ruby 2. I'm um, sorry, Ruby 1. By the way, um, I showed you some code calling module prepend. But actually, these methods are public since Ruby 2.1. So there was a small room of improvement in the code I showed you previously. The send include or send prepend was known as a very common idiom in Ruby. But um, so yeah, it's so so popular. But I didn't like it. I wanted to do this simpler, so I proposed to make them public. So here's my proposal for Ruby 2.1. And <laughs> in the ticket, Matt wrote he didn't write like it, <laughs> but he still kindly accepted my proposal. <laughs> But Matt, you still don't like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, public include is available in Ruby. So you can find actually find um, dot include calls everywhere in Ruby. I'm um, sorry, in Rails and in plugin in gems. So just forget send include. Okay. okay, next topic, refinements. Refinements is another new strategy for monkey patching with a very, I mean, unique, um, what is it, unique scope. It, it, it's, it's known as file scoped monkey patching. Let me explain. Um, who have ever actually used refinements by yourself? Have you ever used refinements? Okay. Only two in this room? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. I don't I know nobody uses it. So I actually created some gems using refinements. One is called database Remi uh, rewinder. So it defines a method in active record connection called execute multiple. And it calls execute multiple inside the plugin. But so this execute multiple method is actually a public method, but it's only visible from inside the plugin. Users can never touch this method. So it's very useful, right? So I personally call this a super private method. It's private inside the plugin. Um, more accurately, it's, it's actually file scoped inside um, each file in the plugin. Okay. So, so it's about plugin. And in, in the Rails code base, I introduce refinements for Rails 5.1 to extend array sum. This is the code. It originally was creating something called rig sum publicly, but I changed this implementation, implementation to use refinement in order not to reveal that rig sum method to the users. So in this case, um, uh, I already told this, I guess. 
Yeah. So refinement was used to uh, like conceal that internal method. So I investigated this uh, feature when implementing this, and I found something weird. It's, I found it's actually not file scoped. The documentation was lie. And so I reported to the, the red mine. Yeah, I filed. I told you it's file scope, but it's a lie. I'm sorry. So here's an example showing the lie. When you um, you can define a refinement in a module. In this case, uh, anonymous module, extending object, and then define the object that is being refined, then it works, okay? So what if we like turn them around like this? Firstly, uh, define a method, then define the uh, refinement extending the method, then it doesn't work. So it's not actually false code, but like, File scope plus physical position scoped. Am I correct, Matt? <laughs> I thought it's a bug, but Matt said it's an intended behavior. <laughs> I think this is very annoying behavior. It's so complex. Um, but... Um, but, but it's said to be intended by Matt. So um, anyway, please mind this, and please beware when you're actually using your refinements. I guess it's the weirdest feature in Ruby so far. So just be careful. Anyway, this funny feature was proposed and implemented by Mr. Shugo Maeda, who's Matt's boss and his company. And this guy created another weird feature in Ruby called protected. <laughs> so here's another topic concerning method visibility and another weird feature in Ruby. So here's an example taken from his own Ruby Kaigi slides. Um, this is the correct way of using protected. But it's never used in this way. And Matt again. Uh, <laughs> he tweeted, if he would design Ruby again, he will not include Ruby in the language feature. <laughs> because I guess he doesn't like the feature. <laughs> so actually, protected is very, very frequently used inside the Rails code base. But almost these use cases of um, protected is misusing protected. You just can rewrite protected to private, and your code should still work. So I tried doing this for Rails like three years ago, but I had to change like 140 files and like about 200 editions, 200 deletions, and the tests were still working still passing, but I gave up pushing this up to the upstream because um, it kind of broke some um, documentations. 
that, that, that happened three years ago, but I finally pushed this last year by separating that huge patch into like several small patches. So it's actually in Rails 5.1. Rails 5.1 does, does no longer abuse protected um, scope. So protected is dead in Rails master. So you also should never use protected again. <laughs> By the way, um, Shugo, the creator of these funny features, is working on his another project recently. It's a text editor in Ruby. <laughs> um, so he's going to do a presentation about the, his new project text editor in next coming Ruby conference called Ruby Kaigi. So don't miss it. Okay. <laughs> So here's another topic. Um, sorry. Mm, private dev, yeah. There's a tiny improvement around method visibility in Ruby 2. So in order to define a private method, we had to define the method like this. In this case, all methods defined below that private are all become all private, right? Or if it's done like this, you can do this also. In this case, the private call takes a symbol of the method name, right? So just like C++ or Java, recent Rubies can do this, private def or public def. Right? It's revolutionally handy, right? So you don't have to repeat the method name twice. So um, it's a very simple trick. He just, uh, the author of the patch just changed the return value of the def statement. So it's it's internally actually doing this, right? Passing the return value of def, def statement to the private statement, right? So this patch was written four years ago. And I suppose this feature is very much important for, especially for the Rails team, I guess, because this is the rail style. <laughs> oh, um, there's, a, there's a kind of group of people who want to write private this way um, um, in this uh, unique style. Um, well, um, I'm not sure if it's a group of people, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anyway, um, <laughs> there's always kind of like the battle between this style and this um, traditional style. So everybody's happy with this, right? <laughs> we don't have to fight anymore, OK? <laughs> so that's why I said this feature is very important for, for you, Aaron. <laughs> But private dev is actually very rarely used inside Rails. I just get grabbed today, and I found only 17 occurrences in private dev in Rails. The reason is because there was a documentation problem in, in private dev until very recent. So, Rails uses rdoc to generate documentation, documents. And rdoc couldn't pr properly generate the, the document for private methods if it's defined that way. And it breaks the Rails API document um, if you use this. So the problem is like this. If you use private 
And then if you define an, any public method below, that public method also is like um, treated as a private method. So that private def changes the scope globally. So why did Ardoc has have such bug? Because the parser is different from the Ruby's parser. It, because Ardoc has its own Ruby parser. Okay. The parser is this this thing, Ruby Lex RB. Actually, it's Lexer. Um, the file is like this. It's a According to the comments, it's a Ruby lexical analyzer written by Keiji Sang, who's the author of IRB. And it requires IRB inside, <laughs> right? It's, it's not a console tool. It's a, it's a document generator, but it requires IRB to use IRB parses feature. So there are three parses in Ruby, parse y and Victor in the standard library, and this IRB parser thing. Actually, Ripper is a Ruby parser in the standard library. So I guess it's Ardoc should use this instead of creating its own parser, right? So why, why doesn't Ardoc? Because Ardoc was created before Ripple was being created. Okay. This is the history. So I tried to rewrite the parser of Ardoc to use Ripper, but I just failed. It was so tough, it's too tough for me. So I gave up doing this. But I brought this task to my uh, Ruby meetup. And actually, someone is using, uh, I mean, working on this to replace our doc parser to use Ripper. And it's going to be, uh, and this person will present about this at the next Ruby Kaigi. <laughs> <laughs> so don't miss it. <laughs> so, anyway, this is the history of Ruby parsers. And yes, this one at the top, IRB, was created in the last century. It's, it's been 20 years, approximately, from the first birth of IRB. So everyone, let's celebrate the 20th birthday of IRB. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the, the anniversary event is going to be happen in <laughs> Ruby Kaiki <laughs> <laughs> by the creator of IRB himself. Anyway, let's go back to the private problem. Uh, how much minutes do I have to him? 20 minutes? Okay, okay, okay. So I said I gave up replacing the art of parser. But I just, instead, I just made a tiny patch resolving my problem for Rails. This is my patch. You can check online. Um, so this patch enables uh, just correctly parsing our, uh, private def on RDoC without replacing the whole parser. So this happened last year. So it took like three, more than three years to support private Jeff and being Rails committers to um, allowing Rails committers to use this new syntax. But it's now available because um, our, our like, has been released with this with my patch and um, Rails 5.1 depends on that version. So you're free to use private Ceph now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So the next topic is keyword arguments. There's something looks like keyword arguments in Rails since it's version one, like this. So these are the me method definitions of some kind of keyword arguments. Or like this, it takes very well their arguments. So internally it uses Ruby hash to pass in something that looks like arguments. Um, I mean keyworded arguments. It, and the method call looks better than like passing in these arguments without names. But on the other hand, the method definition looks like very weird. I mean, it tells nothing to the users. Just like pass in some kind of hash name options or um, you can pass in everything like star args. It's, it really tells the method sign signature tells nothing to the users. And it's actually um, included in Rails toolchain in active support. So this is how Rails extracts the options from the given var args. There's a method on the array called extract options. And since it's just a hash, you can define a default value inside the method like this. And um, yes, inside the method. And also, never forget to write a documentation about the default values outside the document, uh, I mean, outside the method. So you can also ver verify the option keys in this way to make sure um, you haven't got any unexpected keys. This just raises when an expected keys was given. Again, you have to write both the code and the document. So, so then, Ruby 2 finally got the core language feature, keyword arguments, was implemented by Mame, the man of insane. Uh, so we can now rewrite the keyword arguments ish something in Rails from this to be like this. Here is a patch rewriting the, the method. So you see the method signature becomes more like clear to the users what to take, what keys to take, and what default values to take, right? Also the implementation becomes shorter, right? And I guess it runs faster because it's all these like hash manipulation and array manipulation is written in C, right? So I created a branch using keyword arguments, um, I mean introducing keyword arguments to Rails code base back in uh, four years ago before Ruby 2 release. And then I found some problem, some specification problem of keyboard arguments in Ruby. Rails very often defines a key, a method key that, that is exactly like a Ruby keyword, like if, like, like validate if, validate unless, etc. So the keyword argument, a keyword method is actually, can be defined like this. And it can be called like this, but you can never like access that that uh, variable. It causes syntax error. So, with keyword argument, now we can create a never can access variable in Ruby. Okay. I brought this problem to the Ruby core and um, discussed with this. And so we introduced a new feature in Ruby 2.1. 
It's called binding local variable get. This way, we can get the value. This example defines a local variable named nil. Still works, right? And so, I'd like to propose to Rails to use keyword arguments as the first class citizen API in Rails. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't actually proposed this yet, but I'll work on this maybe after this conference. Again, it should run faster, it should make the code more readable and clean, and should make more obvious documentation. So I guess I'm gonna do this. So the next topic is require relative. Yes, require relative. This feature is originally um, introduced into Ruby because of Rails. Um, and it's supposed to run faster than normal require because it, the implementation is much more simple. But Rails doesn't really use this feature today. Most of um, requires in Ruby is normal require instead of recall relative. So there's a huge room for performance improvement, I guess, using recall relative. So I created a patch doing this. I rewrote all requires into require relatives and benchmarked. The result was um, no sig significant performance improvement. So I haven't pushed this to upstream, but I don't know why it's not fast. I discussed with Coach and he said, maybe Bundler is doing a good job um, redefining require and making it faster. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. I'll investigate more, investigate more after this conference. Anyway, um, require relative is basically a good thing, so you may use it. Um, I, I recommend you to use it instead of you require. Should be faster, I guess. Uh, here's another topic. Instruction sequence load and uh, dump and load. Okay, these are public APIs since Ruby 2.2, 2, I guess. And Koichi created something using this, but he said his version doesn't really make Rails faster. But this year, um, Shopify created something resembles to Koichi's one, and they say it's making Rails boot time faster. It's very interesting. It's it's kind of still veiled, um, mysterious, but I heard. One of the creators of this plugin is coming to Ruby Kaiji. <laughs> and so, if you'd like to know more about this plugin, um, I mean this feature, just come to Ruby Kaiji. <laughs> um, he goes on another huge topic <laughs> encoding in Ruby. So, in recent versions of Ruby, every string object has its own encoding. Okay. And we use various encoding. Actually, even Matt uses another encoding other than UTF-8 until like five years ago. But Rails has to be basically um, UTF-8 only uh, framework. Rails doesn't have to deal with multiple encodings internally. Um, I mean, this can be the base, basic strategy against encodings in Rails. Just keep every string to be UTF-8 and convert everything from the outside to UTF-8. Okay. So, for example, you can use any um, encoding for 
writing view templates by um, using another file like editing or putting magic comments on the top. But, I mean, nobody's doing this in Rails. Nobody's writing non-UTFA templates. Um, so, I guess I told this like two years ago in RailsConf, but I'm, I'm planning to drop encoding, multiple encoding support for Action View. Actually, there's a kind of 70% kind of done patch in my machine, but I have, still haven't created a like, test passing <laughs> patch. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just so lazy. I'll do this after. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, uh, there's a library in Active Support called Active Support Multibyte since like 10 years ago, which includes a huge set of Unicode database in this file. So since the encoding handling has been in improved in R Ruby like this, and it has recently uh, very important improvements in 2.4. So by using these features, we can totally remove these, uh, remove that active support version of multiple encoding supports from active support and use the Ruby core feature I18 arms or M17N instead. Actually, we need to do this as soon as possible because the maintainer of the maintainer of the accept support multi byte has just retired from open source thing. So currently, nobody is maintaining that accept support multiple something. So. I'd like to propose to totally remove this, that access board multibyte from Rails in the, maybe in the next version. We've already created a pull request. It's still under discussion, but I hope to merge this into the next version. Okay, next topic, frozen strings. So we've got so many, like, let me freeze some strings in Rails kind of request in the past few years because it makes it kind of makes rails faster a little bit so these are pros and cons of that of freezing strings in the rails code base it really makes the code ugly for example like this it calls dot freeze, dot freeze, dot freeze, dot freeze, dot freeze, dot freeze, dot freeze for every string literals. It's just ridiculous. Honestly, I really, really don't like, I don't want to see this anymore. So, so I proposed to introduce a new magic comment feature in Ruby, just because I didn't want to see that code. Um, to be more accurate, there was already existing proposal, adding magic comments, and I, I just voted a strong plus one for this proposal. And so Matt accepted this proposal, and so it was in, um, introduced to Ruby 2.3 as a core feature. This is the magic comment, frozen string literal true. Also, um, Ruby 2.3 introduced a less known feature, a minus operator for string literal. The minus string literal, you've never heard of this before, I guess. Um, it's actually a little bit faster than calling dot freeze method on string. Um, <laughs> maybe ne you never had, should be care about this, but it's just a tip. So anyway, I, I would like to put the magic comment to all files in Rails. But, but it's a little bit too fast, I mean too early for Rails 5 because Rails 5 still supports a Ruby 
that does not support uh, frozen string uh, magic comment. So maybe we should wait until rel 6 to do this. And here's another topic concerning performance. So Rails 5 does not support Ruby younger than 2.1, just because Ruby 2.2 introduced this feature. Ruby 2.2 collects the symbol garbage. And due to this, um, well, before, before symbol GC, Rails was abusing like strings instead of symbols. Like it, Rails converts every symbol from the outside world to strings, but I guess we don't have to do this anymore. Just sim use symbol as it is everywhere in the Rails uh, in the process. We could do this and we could reduce garbage strings by doing this. I guess, I just guess. It's one of my, another idea making Rails simpler. So here is another recent topic of Ruby. We just unified fixed num and big num into integer. So if your code still accesses fixed num or big num, it warns. So if you find any Ruby gem that warns, just don't use it. Stop using it and find an alternative. OK, finally. As the next topic, I'd like to talk about something, some methods that it originally implemented in XFS port and then ports it into Ruby, like this. Object try, got new lid role in Ruby. Or strip here doc, also got new read low, lid role. Um, here's another minor method, numeric positive and negative or array, append, and prepend. And as Nick stated, um, DHH told something like this on Twitter. Active board can serve an experimental lab for future core features in Ruby. OK, um, can I just have two more minutes? Okay. Here's another method, sum, array sum, and enumerable sum. So this case is a little bit complex. There used to be a active support version of SOM, and Ruby kind of ported array SOM and enumerable SOM, but in a different uh, spec, spec. So the, the behavior is slightly different, uh, differs between the Ruby version and Rails version. But the Ruby version is faster than the Rails one, so um, we'd want to call the Ruby version if possible, and then fall back to the Rails version if something's wrong with the Ruby version. So here is the situation. As I told you before, I somehow, do somehow done using refinements. Um, it kind of works, but it's so complex, the implementation is so complex. Maybe we can make this simpler when we drop supports for the Ruby that doesn't have race home. <clears throat> so anyway, there's such difficulties for Rails team to support multiple versions of Ruby, but for the users, you just can use the newest Ruby and use every new features of Ruby. You can do that for your applications. So, like I showed, Ruby is getting better and better day and day and introducing new features for every version. So, I encourage you to upgrade your Ruby immediately to the newest one and use new features, enjoy new features. So this is, the end of my talk. Um, Ruby is evolving, and Rails also getting better. And as a committer of both, I'm kind of doing 
some like work for the both team. Um, and there are so many more other things to do for both Ruby and Rails. So if you're interested in my talk, I, I encourage you to join us, the development of these language and plugin and frameworks. Right? That's it. Thank you very much. So thank you for having me for this conference. And see you hopefully at another conference <laughs> at Ruby Kaigi. Thank you very much. All right. Do we have any questions? Do we have time still? We'll take a few questions, yeah. Anyone? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you could just approach the mic, actually. My first question today. Actually, it's a, it's a comment. So I did, uh, <laughs> I did a lot of benchmarks with keyword arguments in Ruby 1.9, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2 with the representable gem because we started switching from the options equal hash to the keyword arguments. Mm -hmm. And it was like four times slower than okay, okay. because um, there was some improvement in 2.2. But it was so slow that we had to stay with the with the um, like hash thing because they used Ruby hash in True. the actual implementation. True. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So it's been improved since two three, I guess two two or two three. It's, it's actually still slow in micro benchmark. Do you mind? Do you mind that slowness? Okay. Yeah, I, I just promised to run the benchmarks again with 2.3? Mm -hmm. 2.4. Okay. I'll send you uh, <laughs> a pull request. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Does anyone else have questions? Yeah, you can push the mic. So you mentioned with keyword arguments, if you use a Ruby keyword as the key, mm -hmm. uh, you will create some unreachable uh, variable there? Yes. Uh, if you run in verbose mode, will there be a warning from Ruby? I don't think so. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, I think there are no more questions. Thank you very much, Matsuda. Thank you. Thank you very much.